Hello, everybody. Now, I know what you're thinking. You had this guy on last week. And yes, I, I got the belt, but I'm not going to put it over my shoulder. When we got off the air last week, me and Jeff was talking about 30 minutes, and he has so many interesting stories. I said, dude, why don't you come back and talk about it? And he was like, sure. And I was like, cool. And then we stared at each other for like two minutes. And then I was like, well, I got to go. And he was like, okay, me too. Anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you. This is part two of our interview, Jeff Verdon. And to wrestling fans, you may remember him as a giant warrior. Jeff, how you doing? Doing good. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we were talking off camera. I mean, button his shirt up right here because it's not like I got something to show off. Uh, nah, I look like a dork, but okay. Uh, anyway, so we were talking uh, off camera, and after we we talked for thirty minutes, I was like, "Man, we gotta come. You gotta come back on and tell these stories because we totally missed out on a lot of good stuff." So let's start from the beginning. Let's talk about basketball in your college days. You played against a very famous professional wrestler I in did. the WWE. Uh, he's actually a legend, an icon, and a just recently retired WWE superstar. Yeah, I played uh, college basketball at McMurray University, and we used to play against Texas Wesleyan all the time. Well, I didn't realize it at the time, but I mean, I was playing against Mark Calloway, you know, who later, you know, became famous as The Undertaker. So we had some, uh, we had some battles and stuff for a couple of years and stuff playing each other in college. And, you know, I went to, uh, oh, I guess I've been wrestling for about a year and a half and went to Memphis. And I was asking some of the guys and stuff, you know, of ideas of places to stay. And, you know, Mark came up and said, well, you know, if you don't mind sleeping on a couch, you can stay with me. I said, I didn't have a problem with it. Well, the next morning, he came walking out with a pair of Texas Wesleyan pants, sweatpants on. And it just kind of clicked with us all of a sudden. So it's like, wait a minute, now I know you. And so, you know, we developed a friendship from, from that. We got to know each other in Memphis, and so we spent um, – I guess I was there for three weeks to a month. So we get to spend all that time on the road together and everything. So we, um, we developed a little bit of a relationship from there. And, you know, of course he took off, you know, with wrestling and stuff, everybody goes in their own different directions. And uh, we ran into each other occasionally and stuff at a show. You know, if I would go to, it was backstage at a WWE show. And then we didn't see each other for a long time. And then it was it was funny. I was actually in South Africa in 97, 96, somewhere there. But I was actually bodyguarding while I was over there. And I was bodyguarding and stuff for WWE. You know, the the people that brought them out and stuff contacted us and said, you know, hey, do you, you know, we got this big bunch of wrestlers and stuff coming in. Do y'all want to work? Do y'all want to do the bodyguarding security for them? I'm like, sure, I get paid for two weeks hanging out with a bunch of old friends, so sure, I'll do it. So we got to reconnect there and stuff. He was, we hadn't seen each other until the night of the show, and I had to go get him from his uh, hotel room to bring him to the arena that we were in. And he was so shocked and stuff, seeing me open the door, and there I was. It's like, why are you in South Africa? I was like, I live here. So... And then, you know, we, like I said, we'd see each other, at, you know, at backstage at something. And, you know, it was just like we'd never stop talking. What was he like on the basketball court? He was a good player. You know, he's big, strong. You know, so it was I mean, always. I mean, was he aggressive? I mean, did he. Oh, yeah. She, yeah I'm sure he was a powerful. He was a powerful forward. Am I correct? Power forward center, somewhere in there. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm sure. I mean, was he aggressive? Was he a dentist? You know, yeah, he I throw mean, some we, air bows. Or? We had some battles and stuff under the boards. You know, getting position and everything else on each other. So, yeah, he was he was an aggressive basketball player. No, let me ask you this. This is going to sound like a a douchebag question, and I apologize if it does. If you was in the WWE, I guess I should ask you this. What type of locker room guy was you uh, when you was in the locker room? Was you one of those locker room leaders, or were you one of those people that just kept to themselves, or was you the playful clown, or was – I know this is not you, but was you the guy that people – kicked out of the locker room or bullied. I no, know that's not you, but I was never really bullied by anybody. Well, being but, seven foot, I figured. But I mean, I guess I wasn't. I was a leader type person in the dressing room. And, you know, mostly I was, you know, I would talk to the young guys and help them and offer advice. And, you know, because I was all about giving back to the business. Okay. And to to the layman's, you know, I'm a big wrestling fan, so I know. But, you know, to the people that who don't watch professional wrestling, what does the phrase giving back to the business mean? Well, I mean, it's just the business is, you know, the wrestling world has given me so much, and I've learned so much from other wrestlers along the way, just from, you know, riding in the car with Dick Murdoch and Ivan Koloff. You know, that was a great learning experience. I travel with Bobby Jagger sometimes. And, you know, so the guys that you would ride with, you would learn. Uh, you'd learn things from them, you know, bounce ideas off and things like that. And I, so there was a lot of guys that really helped me when I first got started. And I just kind of wanted to pay it back and, you know, help these young kids that, you know, to get to where I was or to get even further and stuff in their career than what I was able to do. So that that's what God, I think I, by giving it back to the business. I hate to sound like this. I, I know it's 2021. I know we all know wrestling is portrayed to be a sport. It's not really a sport. It's just it's hard for me to talk like this because I still watch it like a sport. It's not fun talking about this stuff, but I have to because wrestling fans today, this is how they talk. So I got to adapt. You know, was it anybody that you ever got in the ring with and you did not want to put over? Meaning, no, you had to look, you had to lose. No, I never had a problem with that. It was, you know, I know there are some guys out there that, that do have a problem with it, but as long as it was right, you know, and it was done in a certain way, I didn't have a problem getting beat by anybody. Just had to be believable. Now, we, yeah, of course. You know, uh, there's one famous professional wrestler in uh, Mexico that you work with. Uh, uh now, there's a famous Mexican wrestler that you work with, and he's famous in the U.S. for a phrase called no job. And you may have heard it on the Comrade Thompson, Bruce Pitcher uh, podcast. I lived it. Uh, huh? He lived I it? I lived it. I've worked with him many times. Yeah. Mel, Mel, Mel Marasquez, am I saying that right? Mel Mascaras. Mel Mascaras. Okay. I, being half Puerto Rican, you would think uh, I, it's actually a, a Latin singer that I'm actually going to interview later this week. And she says, my Spanish sounds Chinese. She says, I speak the best <laughs> Chinese. Uh, but yeah, tell me your relationship with him. You know, Mel was always one of those guys and stuff that he believed everything about that was ever written about himself. So you know, out of all the mass guys in Mexico that I wrestled with and were in locker rooms with, which was probably 80% of the wrestlers in Mexico wore a mask, Mill was the only one that I ever knew that you didn't see his face. He had a special way. And so he had a dress mask that he would wear into the arenas that had a zipper up the back. 
And then he would um, pull the chin up, put the chin to his other mask, and as he's pulling the one off, he's pulling the other one on. So you never really saw his face. You know, the wrestlers never saw his face because he took a shower with his mask on and always did that change and stuff with the mask. Stuff. So, I mean, it was always, to me, I thought it was a bit pompous, I guess. You know, because I, mean, I, I get, you know, when we're back, to, you know, when you're, you're backstage and stuff, you're, it's more your personality to get, that's going on in the backstage instead of your gimmick. And Mel right. lived his gimmick. The only time I ever saw him without a mask on was when we would fly together on a, to have to go do a show and we're on the same plane because he couldn't wear his mask on the plane. And that was the only time I ever saw him without a mask on was on an airplane. I, so I not fun to work that. with. He was fun to work with or not? No, he wasn't fun to work with at all because he was another one that – you know, he had such a big name in Mexico that um, he just, it, that ego and stuff just exuded from him. Even when he was in the ring, he didn't like to sell a lot. And I mean, you know, my God, he was six one maybe and 240, 250. And I mean, I was wrestling, I'm, seven foot and they booked me at seven two but I was 340 375 and he didn't like to sell for me even as much bigger than I, I was than him so that became a frustration so, so how do you work with somebody like it's a tape right now that goes on it on YouTube of Bruiser Brody and Les Luger and you I've can tell that. yeah you can tell Bruiser wasn't uh he wasn't ready to play alone and uh, no. or work. He did, he wasn't ready to work with Lex. I, how if you ever get in that position, how do you handle that? See, because in my mind, I would think to myself, "Well, I want this match to go good, so I'm going to do everything this guy wants me to do. And if he wants me to just take a whooping, I'm going to whooping so we can get the hell out of here and make it look good for the fans." But you see Lex kind of getting like, you know, scared, no kind of like, what the hell am I supposed to? Yeah, he didn't know what to do. And as a layman, I'm a layman, and I'm never – I want to make it very clear. I think, Jeff, you know this. I've never been in the wrestling business. However, you know, if I was put in that position, the first thing I guess I would think to myself, I guess in 1987 or 86 when that happened, is different from 2021 uh, because now everybody knows about the professional wrestling business. Right. I, if I was in that position and I know a match is supposed to go this way, but he ain't working with me, I would do everything that he wants to do and then take the one, two, three and get the hell out of there. It just seems common sense to me. Well, what would you do if that, if you ever got in that predicament, I know you got a predicament with one guy that we talked about in the first interview, but if you was in that predicament Les Luger was in, or what would you do? Well, you know, Brody always had that uh, reputation that he could be tough to deal with sometimes. Um, so that situation, I mean, Lex and stuff was – still pretty new in his career and being in that same spot, I don't know what I would have done. Now, years down the road stuff, I mean, I would have probably tried to grab a hold of some kind and find, you know, what's going on. You know, let's get this match. Let's have a good, finish this match up good and stuff and go home. But, yeah, I've, ne I've never really had anybody that um, do anything like that to me. That was just the craziest video I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, you know, if say you and me was wrestling each other, you know, and let's say you didn't want to sell for me, it's going to be believable that, you know, if I hit you, it's not going to hurt. Right. So, so hypothetically speaking, if the booker goes in and says, okay, I want the jokester to go over giant killer, 
but John Killer says, you know what? I don't want that. He don't he don't say nothing. He just goes to the ring and then I start hitting you. You're not selling. Nothing's going right. I know in my heart that if I hit you for real, that's not going to be believable anyway. If for you to be even feel my punches, so I'll yeah, that's what I probably would do. It's easy for me to be on chair quarterback and never been in the wrestling ring a day in my life to say what I will and what not do. But just play with me for a second, Jeff. But if I go in the ring and then you don't want to play along, I'm just gonna go. Hey, what do you want to do? Tell me what you want to do. Oh, you want you want? Yes. Okay, I want to go get paid. So t- I'm ass whooping. You get me one, two, three, and then get out of there. That, and then the booker pays me my money. And then I'll yeah, take the next show. You know, situations like that stuff. One stuff when matches turn into shoots, they're not yeah. they're not fun to watch. I mean, it's nobody's selling. I disagree with that. Year. I, I, I disagree with that. That that little shoot fight between Hack Saw Hack um, Hack Saw Jim Duggan and uh, Doink the Clown, that was pretty entertaining. I don't guess I've ever seen that one. Yeah, go on YouTube. Uh, the original Doink the Clown, he's passed yeah. away now. Matt but Hack Saw, it was a yeah Matt Bourne versus uh Hack Saw Jim Duggan, and you can see them just start trying to hit each other and then all of a sudden they both get up and, it was, and you hear them you want to work you want to work and and, and you can see hat sauce kind of flustered he's got his hands up and matt's got his hands up do you want to work and then and then he hacks i was like do you want to work do you want to work and they both was like and then they finally got out of the ring and you can tell the like the both like pissed and uh Another wrestler from TNA comes in there, like, "What's wrong? What happened?" I mean, massage your shoulders. It was. I like watching shoot fights. I like watching those fights. Like, there's one famous Antonio Noki versus uh, some. I forgot his name. Oh, okay, yeah, I know which. I know which video you're talking about. I, I haven't seen it, but I heard. Uh, what boring and bad it was. Watch, uh, watch, watch this guy get hit. Well, excuse my language, Jeff, but uh, watch him. This guy, he was you could tell like John uh, Tony Noki. I don't know. You can see somebody not trying to sell for a legendary fighter, a legendary professional wrestler in Japan, and that legendary professional wrestler and that legendary fighter beats the crap out of this guy, and it turns into a real shoot fight. But what I said, you work a lot in Japan. How is it to work with somebody who, between the Japanese language and the American language, I mean, how do y'all communicate in the ring? I always wanted to know that. Most of the guys spoke English in Japan. And for those that didn't, really? the referee did. You know, the referee spoke oh. English. We would have to run things through him if we were wanting to do something with a guy that didn't speak English. But there were... A lot of the guys over there that spoke English. As a, as a kid, I always wondered, like, did the great Muta, great Muta understand what was going on? Like, you know, because for me, it was a shoot. Uh, I always wonder, like, did the, you know, the Japanese wrestlers know, you know, what we were saying? You know, just oh, yeah. as a kid, you got to you got to look at it like a 10 year old is thinking like. Well, There's no way going guys. on. And, you know, especially yeah. the top guys like Muda or Ninoki or Baba or, you know, Tenru, Jumbo Saruta. You know, all those guys spoke English because they traveled. You know, they all worked in the States. You know, in various parts of their career, usually early in their career, you know, the, the funks used to always bring in some of the guys from all Japan to, to wrestle there and learn the American style and train them a little bit. But those guys all spoke English except by the end of the day, at least enough that you can get a match out of them. You know, it may not be an easy conversation like we're having, or if you want to have a conversation with me in Spanish, it won't be pretty. But it was enough. Oh, no. Especially with me. <laughs> I told you my Spanish is my Spanish is the best Chinese 
you're ever going to learn. Uh, it's like, wow. <laughs> it's funny because when I talk, you know, my relatives, I get around my relatives and, you know, not only am I Southern, I got that speech impairment. So I can't roll my R's. I can't, you know, I, like Spanish is, I probably can learn Japanese better than I can learn Spanish. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's just, it just is what it is. But uh, so with that said, what was I going to get? Uh, I was going to go somewhere. Uh, but yeah, like that match with uh, you and your tag team partner and Andre the Giant and Giant Baba. Like, right. did did Americans know what buttons they can push outside America? Like here in America, you pretty much know what you can do, especially back in the eighties and nineties. In twenty twenty one, you look at somebody the wrong way, you're gonna get sued for or for racism or sexism or right. something. But but back, like I remember watching that match, the one that Andre the Giant slapped the hell out of you. Yeah. Uh, he he get Andre the Giant grabs some flowers and he uh threw them over the top rope. Like, and you know, I always wondered, like, did he know that was acceptable? I mean, because it, in some cultures, you know, like you it's some things you just can't do. You know right. what I mean? Like, like in like you go to Korea. North Korea and wrestle, which they have one wrestling event that WCW put on. You know, I'm pretty sure they were walking on eggshells. Oh, sure. Well, did you ever have a, yeah, did you ever have any t- time where you went to a foreign country and you wasn't sure what you could or could not do to get heat? Oh, yeah. And, you know, well, when we were in Japan, is that a lot of times the, the referee would come and tell us and stuff, you know, you can wrestle on this side and this side and this side of the ring don't go to the other side of the ring and wrestle and stuff because that was all Yakuza. So that was a Japanese mafia on that side and you didn't want to take a chance on you know, falling into one of them or into their wives or you know, splattering blood if you were bleeding. Um, so that was, that was something that we were told over there but you know, I've, wrestling in India that was a, a kind of rough situation there because there was a lot of stuff going on in various parts that you know there were a lot of uneasiness i mean we were our train going back to it was bombay at the time from Mumbai now but i mean our train got blown up the car in front of me and stuff where several of the wrestlers were so that car got blown up with a couple of pipe bombs so i mean that made for a for a very interesting um, situation. And I mean, we, you know, we had guard in some places we had guards at the end of our hallway. They get on the bus and ride with us to wherever we were going. You know, and I've never really had to deal with anything where I had such military presence as that. You know, I mean, I did a show in Beirut. We were looking at some famous rock in a harbor where they used to do, um, the high diving stuff from and there was a car the station wagon that pulled up and it was you know you couldn't you could just hear them talking but i could see that the guy that was kind of our tour guide and the bus driver kind of got this perplexed look on his face and i came and asked him i said what are they saying they're saying well death to americans and death to westerners so at that point we decided it was time to get back in the in the bus and go back to the hotel so, I mean, I've had some situations and stuff like that, but they didn't happen often. Uh, what was most important to you when you was in that ring? It was, uh, especially as a a bad guy, if you will, because you played most of the time in your career, you was a bad guy. Yeah. What was the most important thing to you, getting the good guy over or getting the heat? Um, I guess the stuff probably getting the heat more than what it was just focusing on getting a baby face over and stuff. It was the heat that I was able to create with that baby face that 
you know, you, you give them the good comebacks and things like that. And I mean, it just makes them strong. But I mean, I thought, I always uh, thought the tweet and stuff was important. Well, what was one, that one time that you thought you went too far with the heat? Yeah, I don't know that I, guess I the, the time you got stabbed, maybe? Oh, well, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've caused riots in various places around the world. Uh, caused several uh, don't you, don't you, don't, don't you wish wrestling was still like that? Like 96 when oh. Hogan turned, uh, turned bad and tra- everybody started throwing trash. And the fan, fan, two fans got, I think it was just one fan got in the ring. And I got you, I miss those days. I, you know, and then, I enjoyed them more. You know, the secret, yeah, the secret was out. Everybody knew what professional wrestling was, but just by, I, it, it's called it what it is. Hulk Hogan was a cultural icon. Right. And for him to go, you know, people always remember him from being, you know, this big good guy. And for him just to leg drop Macho Man Randy Savage and join the NWO, he saw the trash and all this. You never, I don't think, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think we're ever going to see that in professional wrestling ever again. But, you know, I've had, um, this is probably early 2000. Five, six, seven, somewhere in there. I mean, I remember working um, with a kid in Dallas. And I mean, it was basically just me beating the crap out of him and stuff for most of the match. You know, give him a couple of hope spots here and there, but they just wanted me just to completely overpower him because he wasn't a big kid. You know, he's probably 5'10. You know, and 200 pounds maybe. (laughs) And I was like 350, 360. But I had, we had done the thing to where I did three choke slams on him. And I did the first one, went for the cover, pulled him up on the second one. So, you know, he had, uh, we I did a second choke slam and he started bleeding from his mouth. And so I still wouldn't pin him. I did it a third time and, and you know, then he blew blood up in the air. And I had the lady at ringside so that waited outside of my dressing room to ask me, and so what was I doing out there? This is not supposed to be, you're not supposed to be trying to hurt people out there. This is supposed to be entertainment, and you're out there trying to hurt somebody. I just can't believe you would do something like that. So, I mean, there are still fans out there that still believe everything they see. I try to. I, I, I can't. It's it's hard to watch professional wrestling and and like these wrestling fans they want to watch spots and yeah. and and talk about and grade them you know this is a three star match it was some good workers in the ring and like can't you just sit down and watch the match and look at yeah. you know just enjoy it I, I mean I, yeah it's sometimes I watch a match and I'm like God Lee can you just fight work a hold but. But most of the time, I'm just watching, like, this is a YouTube channel. I try to get into it because he'll talk about uh, wrestling, pay-per-views. And, and, but he'll, he's some guy, uh, Wrestling Regret. I forgot what the name of the YouTube. I try to watch it. But then he starts talking about how good these workers were. And, and it, it was a good work rate and this and that. Well, whatever it just happens is just some good old fashioned violence. Two guys yeah. in the ring and fighting for the same thing you know, with you know, football. You know, you've always got your armchair quarterbacks that think that they know everything. They've never been in a ring a day in their life. But I've been watching it since I was a kid. I know everything. And yeah, I, 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 I I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people who will go ahead and admit that, hey, look, I don't know. I, I know what I've been told. I, I know what. But other than that, I'm just gonna, I'm not going to pay now fifty four dollars because I bought that revolution, the AEW revolution for fifty four dollars, which is ridiculous. It should go down to thirty dollars. But uh, 
you know, when I'm paying for a pay per view, I'm not taking notes about work rate. I'm, I'm, I'm watching violence. This is life and yeah. death. This is, you get in that ring. It, it's like, it's supposed to be like boxing and UFC. It's, you get in that ring. It's, you, it's, it's like, yeah, it's, it's about to go down. It's a fight. But no, people, they just, wrestling fans now are just like, I want to see a good work. I want to, uh, two good workers. They don't even call them wrestlers no more. They sit there and call them wrestlers workers now. Like shut. Some of them return from from wrestlers, and you know, because I mean, we always yeah, call I know. Them workers. And then once they learn, yeah, that, I know they want to say, "Oh, look at me!" And so I'm just gonna call them wrestlers or workers because I know the wrestling business now. Yeah, I, I'm like, dude. Hey, there's two people when I'm watching wrestling. There's two types of people I don't want around me. Uh the those fans that want to talk about work rate and 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 sp- look at that spot right there and and y- you know they, they could have done this and then this spot and the uh, people well you know wrestling was real back in my day but you know now it's real fake you know those two people and as growing up I used to get oh you a pit- you want to see something like get pissed off like get the fuck out of Go so I can't watch wrestling with other people. I've learned that when I'm watching wrestling, I got I'm the type of person like get, leave me the phone, just go somewhere else. Don't come in here. Don't because they know, especially family members, they know how to piss me off. They it's just like I don't need your comments. I don't need your, you know, tell me your wrestling story from 1967. Just get the just get leave and my kids know it irritates me too and then my son who has uh who you know when you become a father you always want to you know have that moment with your son like me for me watching wrestling with my dad it was one of those things and my son like hates professional wrestling and he makes a habit that every time I'm watching wrestling to tell me how fake it is because he knows it pisses me off. It, you know, you're supposed to be scared of your dad, you know. Most of us so. will accept anything that people want to say except that it's fake. Well, you know, yeah, because I mean, you're a professional if, wrestler. If wrestling is fake, why do we have so many injuries and, you know, broken bones and torn ligaments and Knee reconstructions, shoulder reconstructions, necks. I mean, if it's so fake, why do we get hurt? Right. And they can and never it, really it, explain it, that to me. Well, he's nine, so right. he's just trying to he's he's just trying to piss daddy off. And he does a good job doing it. <laughs> uh but yeah, that makes a good point too, you know. Uh if, if one day you're gonna say that to the wrong person, and oh, yeah. like, like, yeah, like Jeff Burden come and sit down and watch, and we're watching WWE Network together, and then this nine year old kid talking about how fake it is. I'm not gonna step in when you choke slam. <laughs> is that? <laughs> I don't know. I, does yeah, that feel I've fake, kid? One, I've never been one to get that bent out of shape by it. You know, I would correct them in the ways that we did stuff. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, this, this is definitely not fake. Now, it, I'll agree to it's predetermined, it's choreographed, we know what we're going to do and how everything is. But, I mean, there's times and stuff, you know, when we're laying in shots and stuff with forearms and chops and stuff like that, those are stiff. I mean, we're throwing them hard. But we're throwing them in areas and stuff where we're not going to hurt the other guy. Right. You know, if I want to throw a forearm across your upper back and stuff across your shoulder blades, I'm not going to hurt you with a forearm. So I can hit you about as hard as I want to. It's not going to hurt you. You Stop know. Me that. <laughs> well, I mean, you can, you, you can do that with anybody. You're not going to hurt somebody hitting them across the shoulders and stuff in their back. It's just, you know, it's not like hitting somebody in the nose or, 
you know, stomping on somebody's hand. You know, that I mean, those are things that's where you can get bones broken, but you're not going to break anybody's bones by hitting them across the chest or hitting them across the back. That's why chops and forearms and things like that are as loud as they are because we throw them a little bit harder than what we do the other things. And that's one of the biggest things for people who used to watch wrestling back in the 80s. You know, the big rule was you couldn't throw a fist. You had to hit with your forearm. The, the, throwing a fist was against the rules, especially back in the I've NWA days. Huh? I've always thrown punches. I mean. Yeah, you, you had to do it kind of. But the rule was back in the 80s, you know, for, you couldn't throw a punch. You always had to use your forearm, and that was a rule. People don't remember that, but uh, that that was uh. Anyway, wrestling was. We're talking very about good as far as a referee talking about hitting somebody with a closed fist. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't hit with a closed fist. We never it, listened it, to the that's, You, it, that's why you got stabbed right there because you didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I, you know, like I said, especially when I was in South Africa, my style was very violent. Uh, did, did, did you ever know Bruiser Brody? You know, I met him one night at the matches and gave him a ride back to his hotel, and that was that was really the only time I had ever met him. I would have loved to, though. I mean, I know his his wife. I've talked to his wife several times except in the last few years, but I would have, that's the one person. If I, I guess if I had a dream match of who to wrestle against, it would have been Brody. Did you ever have a relationship with uh, the guy who killed him? Cause you wrestled yeah. in Puerto Rico and he was a big yeah, name I've, I've, in Puerto Rico. Jose Gonzalez. Yeah. Wrestled as the invader. Number one. Right. How many times have you been in the ring with him? Oh, God. We tagged together several times. I mean, like I said, when I was in Puerto Rico, I was a baby face all the time. And so was he. So, yeah, you know, I had him as a partner a few times. Went and did saves and stuff for him. Uh, personal question, if you don't want to answer. Did you and him ever talk about it? No. No, 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 no. That was kind of like a like – a, no, no topic. Yeah, nobody ever really discussed that. Yeah, you know, you, you didn't always discuss it with him. You didn't discuss it with Cologne or um, any of the guys over there. It was just a subject that was never really talked about. But I know the first couple of times I was in the same dressing room and I always looked to see what he had in his bag when he opened his bag up near me. <laughs> but always wanted to make sure you was on his good side. Mm -hmm. Definitely so. But I mean, I I never had a problem with him. We got along fine. That's good. It's always good to get along with a murderer. But hey, uh, I wasn't there. Who who am I to say what happened in that shower? But uh, it does seem a little fishy. Oh but, yeah. Uh, I talked to a lot of the guys that were over there when that happened. You know, yeah, and I listen to the stories. Yeah, I listened to some of the stories. But last thing I want to talk about, you we talked about one WWE icon, and we're gonna talk about another WWE icon, and uh you was real, real good friends with, and you was there from the beginning to the end with this guy. Uh you know him as Rodney. I knew him as Loco Zuna. Uh, tell us about y'all's relationship and how it got started. Oh, God. First time I ever met him or worked against him. Um, <laughs> it was just a funny joke and stuff. Of, you know, I was young. I was green. I didn't know any better. And, you know, Dory had always taught me when he was training me and stuff, you know, listen to my heels and they'll get me through the match. And so I wrestled against uh, a tag match with him and one of his cousins, I think Samu. And they did nothing but just snap mare me and snap mare me in the corner. So, I mean, that was a big running joke between us for a long time. And then um, 
when we were both working in Mexico. So Carlos Minez and stuff that had uh, the UWF at the time, we would go in for two weeks and leave for four and then come back in again. So, I mean, we were doing that for, we did that for well, almost a couple of years. So, I mean, we got in, he always brought Rodney in with me. So we were tagging together all the time. So, I mean, that was always a lot of fun. You know, he had a great mind for the business. And, you know, I could see where we needed to go with things at times and stuff. So, I mean, we worked really well together. And, I mean, we stayed in touch for quite a while and didn't um, didn't see each other for a few years. I would moved to South Africa. So, I mean, nobody really knew where I had gone. And they came in. Uh, when WWE came in, we were doing the bodyguarding contract. Well, my job and stuff was to drive him around in a van because he couldn't fit on the bus. So, so that was a lot of fun. But we were on the, I guess, the, the fatal tour and stuff in England. And we had just been on a long run where we were away from our, our normal places that we were staying. And um, so it, it was just a long, hard weekend of like three or four days away from what we were used to and the next day we were supposed to go to a show so I went up to get him and there was no answer and um, so they opened up the hotel room door and you know there he was dead in his, his bed but he I mean he looked like he went peacefully it looked like he was just asleep so you actually found him dead yeah and then I worked with and how, the promoter, and then I had to call the family and tell everybody what had happened. And I think I called Offa first and told wow. Offa because I didn't really know how to get a hold of anybody else. And so then I got Rikishi's number, and then I let Junior know as well. Wow. So how long did you know Loco Zuna? Oh, God. I mean, I met him the first time in 87 when I started. I mean, I had been wrestling right. for probably three or four months when I met him the first time. And you, he passed away, what, 98, 99? 2000. October 23rd. I, October 23rd. October 23rd. I, I never forget it. I have a shot of Jack Daniels because that was what he liked to drink. So I have a shot of mm. Jack Daniels every year and stuff as a remembrance to him. And there's not a day go by I don't miss him still. Wow, oh, I mean, you know, I don't. I have a lot of acquaintances. I only have a few friends, and I probably don't have like one best friend. Ah, uh, and even my best friend and me are not that damn close. Uh with that said, uh it must, it has to be hard to have that type of relationship with somebody, and just knock on his door and see him gone. I, I, I wouldn't know what to do. It wasn't easy, <clears throat> and I yeah. wasn't able to wrestle that night. So, yeah, I'm sorry for your loss too, man. Because I, I know you probably rough, you can tell about man. you can tell about you can tell you can tell just the way you tell the story that he was someone that was close to you. He was. He was. He's one of the best people I've ever met in my life. <clears throat> so, you know, as I I Ow, my sister when she came over. You know, we were at the funeral home and stuff where he was laying in rest. And, you know, we would go there almost every day until we were able to get things together to get him home. So it was it was did, a rough time. Did the WWE ever get in contact with you about the documentary they had? No. No. <clears throat> Funny enough, though. I watched it the other night. There's actually a picture of me, if you know it's me. When uh, we were on tour in Saudi Arabia, and we were on the yacht and stuff of one of the princes. And there's a shot on there and stuff where you can see Rodney. I'm bent over picking something up. And then uh, one of the guys that was in charge of the tour over there. So, yeah, that's my only... <laughs> That's the only thing I'm in that documentary about. What what was 
uh, local Zuna. I'm gonna call him local Zuna because that's the way I know him. Uh, what what was his relationship at the time of his uh, of his death with the WWE? He had, um, you know, they let him go because he got too big. You know, at one point he was up to 700 pounds. And when he, we were in England and stuff, he was working on still trying to to drop his weight. And, you know, he still wasn't – he said once they got him under the 600-pound mark, they would look at bringing him back. So he was get, trying to get ready for that. And, um, you know, he was – I think he was six and a quarter when he died. So, I mean, he was, he was getting close to that – that mark so he could go back. And, you know, he had, he said, you know, he had told me that he had talked to Vince and stuff and he had a big guy he wanted to bring in when he came back. And I, you know, that was going to be me, but you know, that never transpired and stuff because he passed away. Well, I'll tell you this, I would love to see you in the WWE. You have been, uh, I would have liked to have had been heavyweight one. You would have been heavyweight champion. <laughs> you would have beat. You would have killed Stone Cold and Kane and Undertaker. Oh, I would have got part the opportunity to work with them. And it would be shoot fights too. <laughs> there would be real fights. Nah, The Rock would have got whooped. He would. You would lay the, the smacker down. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing. You know, Yokozuna. My favorite re- wrestling moment, yeah, I'm, I'm almost scared to say this, because it's not remembered by wrestling fans. I, I get too f- crass about re- re- wrestling fans, because every wrestling fan that says this is the worst moment ever in wrestling history, does it? D- one, wasn't alive during that time, and two, uh, don't look at the crowd as a crowd go crazy when it happens, and people don't understand that their opinion doesn't matter. But anyway, my favorite wrestling moment of all time was WrestleMania 9. Uh, I hate this. One of my favorite wrestlers of all time, Bret the Hitman Hart, just lost the title. And Hulk Hogan comes out there and uh, checks on his buddy, Bret Hart. And uh, Mr. Fuji Fuji sits there and talks some trash. And tells Hogan, you know, you yellow belly getting the and local Zuna will kill you and this and that. And Hogan accepts the challenge and gets in the ring, leg drop, one, two, three. And I'm telling you, I was 10 years, I think I was 10, somewhere around there. And I cried like a baby because I was happy. My hero, the immortal Hulk Hogan, was back because people don't remember Hulk Hogan was gone for one year. And Hulk Hogan was back and he won the championship. And I remember I, I was sitting in my dad's room because that's where the TV room was. And I cried of happy tears. And my my dad, who's a big tough guy, you know, you know, he's not one to, you know, but he is looking at me like Joey. I remember my dad was like, Joey, come on. I couldn't stop crying. I was so happy. <laughs> and uh, I, my dad, he he was a no nonsense type of guy. Like he, I would probably figure that my dad would probably knock the hell out of me if that if I if I could control my tears and my happiness, my dad would probably you know I wouldn't have done it because my dad I would be afraid my dad would knock the hell out of me for being stupid. Uh, but uh, no, I couldn't control my tears. I was so happy. And I just remember my dad, that tough guy, just going, Joey, come here, boy. Come here. <laughs> I was so I was so happy Hogan won that belt. You must have really man. gotten upset when Yoko beat him a few months later. He I was pissed. <laughs> I, I, I didn't enjoy the rest of it. You know, Bret Hart won the King of the Ring that night, and I, I, I wasn't I wasn't enjoying it. I was pissed. I hated Yokozuna. Hate it. it. It's only some some people that I forgave for beating Hogan. Sting was one of them because I was a big Sting fan. Uh, Goldberg, you know, I, I didn't like it that night, but you know, Goldberg was a a beast. 
in my mind, WCW screwed Hogan over. He should never. <laughs> That's how serious you were. You were a diehard yeah. Hogan fan. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm still. You know, I'm I'm loyal to my. You know, I'm loyal to the A. I'm loyal to the Falcons. I'm loyal to the Bulls. I'm loyal to my. You know, my favorite wrestlers, my favorite boxers. You know, uh, if I like you, I like you. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah. I remember that 93, we were sitting there, we were watching the pay-per-view, and uh, Loco beat Hogan, and the rest of the pay-per-view, I was pissed off. Even when Bret Hart won the King of the Ring, I was still pissed off. And I'm thinking to myself, Hogan's going to come back, he's going to beat, come back and kill Loco, and we didn't see him again. He went to no. WCW. And I was like, and I was pissed that he was in WCW. Because then WWE started doing little magazine things and talking about Hogan was scared. And, he, and I was like, man. Anyway, that's, when that's, how serious I took, that's how serious I took wrestling as a kid. And like, dude, sounds like you still got some <laughs> bitter issues. Anyway, uh, Jeff. It was an honor talking to you again. I uh, thank you for coming back on. We Good talked to talk an to hour you. today. Uh, yeah, I mean, consider yourself part of the CTS family. I, I appreciate you coming on, talking about a difficult time in your life with the local Zuna. Uh, I was just playing. Uh, I was almost somewhat serious when I said I didn't like local Zuna. I don't like him in the ring. Okay. As a human being, he probably was the greatest human being ever. But, in my uh, opinion, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's not an opinion because I heard a lot of good things about this guy. And uh, I wish I – you know, if I knew the guy, I probably would think he was gold. And uh, no, I don't think it's an opinion. I think it was a fact. I think he probably was one of the great human beings in this world. Uh with that said, anything that you wanted to plug for no, the second just time? Still, uh, you know, we've still got our Clarence Publishing where we're, you know, where I do ghostwriting and I can take a book from concept to putting it on the shelf and putting it on Amazon. So, I mean, we're busy with that. Uh, I offer wrestlers a discount, just kind of another way of giving back, I guess. And then we have our uh, at-large public relations company that's, we stay pretty busy doing traditional press releases and things like that. Well, there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always an honor and a privilege to have Giant Warrior, a.k.a. Jeff Burden, on the show. This is one week. You, you're watching this now. is uh, It's probably, I don't know, May, maybe. But I talked to them, him. Last, I talked to him. I talked to this guy last week, and I said, "Man, we missed out with a lot of great stories. I got to have you back. Can we do it again the following week?" He came back on. He's uh, somebody that I got the utmost respect for. I uh, appreciate you coming on, Jeff. You stay on the line. Everybody else, don't please hit the subscribe button. It's not going to hurt you. It may hurt you. But still hit it. Hit it as hard as possible you can and hit the like button. With that said, just stay online, everybody else. I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>